but I am truly excited and glad that you're here with us, uh, most of you. Some of you, I look around and I'm not sure I want to see you ever again. Just kidding, just kidding. So we're good. We're glad you're here. I already talked to a few visitors this morning. Thank you, visitors, for coming out and being a part of our service. Let's go ahead and get started with a few songs this morning. Got a very special uh, speaker going to be speaking with us here in just a few minutes. Stand with me. Let's sing Mansion Over the Hilltop. got a mansion over that hilltop. <laughs> oh, I guess everybody may be so. Okay, that's good. Glad you're here with us today again. And uh, we, this next song, there's a particular place you're supposed to clap. If you know where that place is, clap. Okay? <laughs> uh, that's not it. That's not it. Here we go. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. Thank you. 
did well very good thank you so much for that let's sing this next song beautiful song everyone needs compassion we've got a special missionary with us today this talks about the nations and the things that everyone needs that compassion all over this world today that great for you and me I believe that I hope that you do too he is that author of salvation he is the one that we trust in for our salvation but the whole world needs to know and needs to hear about what he did for them as well this next song is very beautiful as well sing it with me
it's okay if we be silent once in a while, right? It's okay if we allow God to speak to us. It's okay if we allow him and his spirit to dwell within us and to use us to glorify him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We're so grateful for what you have, so grateful for what you do in our lives. Thank you for this time together. We thank you for this young man coming before us today for his faithfulness for all these years, working with manna for all these years, uh, faithful service. We're grateful for that. We thank you for what you're going to do in our service today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to introduce my friend, and several of you know him by now, Chuck Ward. Chuck and I have been friends for too many years, Chuck. Close to 40. <laughs> That's too many for some of you. We're so grateful to have this opportunity. Chuck Ward's going to be speaking to us today, uh, talking a little bit more about manna. Our church already supports manna, but he's got some good things to say for us today and just remind us of what manna does. And so, Chuck, I'm so grateful for you being here. Thank Thanks, you, Steve. Sir. Appreciate it. Did you notice he said young man to me? He said, <laughs> and it's actually, um, I am older than he is. So I uh, appreciate the young part there, Steve. Uh, it's good to be here. I tell you, it, it's good to be back in the United States of America, even if it's only for just a few days. I head back out uh, this coming Friday, but um, I appreciate you and appreciate the many, many years that your church has been a part of the ministry of Manor Worldwide. And, uh, you know, our ministry, for those of you that don't know what our ministry is, um, we're, we're coming up on, I think it's on there, 24 years um, the ministry of Manor Worldwide. If we can go to that next slide. If we can go to that next slide. Sorry, we've had some difficulties with uh, our, our slides. Appreciate Richard worked all morning long to get this going. Um, and so, but I appreciate all his hard work this morning. But 24 years Manor Worldwide has been in existence. For those of you who don't know what the ministry is, we, we actually partner with missionaries, national pastors on foreign countries uh, to meet a need. It started off being feeding centers, and the majority of our projects are feeding centers. Uh, your church supports a feeding center uh, there in, uh, in Boquete, Panama, and I uh, appreciate your support for that. Um, but we've kind of grown, and as throughout the years, we've been open to new opportunities. Um, the feeding centers, when the kids come, they, they are fed. Um, most of these children are really, really starving and poverty-stricken, and I'll have some pictures here in just a minute, let you see a little bit about the Ministry of Manna, but uh, we've branched out since then. We've got several orphanages around the world. Um, we have schools. We have medical centers. Um, we have trade schools. Uh, any way in which God has opened up a door so we can meet a, a physical need, meet a personal need. But I want you to think about that. You know, there's a lot of ministries out there that do just that. and They do a great job at that. But let me tell you something. Those kids, when we feed them, guess what? They're hungry the next day. And they're hungry the next day. But what we do is we use that as a tool to reach them with the most important thing, and that's Jesus Christ. And so every one of our projects has a church established with it. Um, and so all of those centers, um, we have a place for them when they come to be fed um, and, to, and to be ministered to. But then on Sunday morning, we've been able to see churches uh, explode with this ministry. Uh, today, Manor Worldwide has right at 250 projects in 45 countries. Uh, tomorrow, there'll be over 16,000 children being fed all around the world. But more importantly, we've been able to share Jesus Christ with these children. And many of those children and their families have come to know Jesus Christ. We've also been able to start about 120 churches uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, four years, and so we appreciate your church and and the part that you, partnership that you have. And I just put a little thank you up there for many many years of partnering with our church and helping support my family uh, through your through your giving here supports my family. Um, and so we want to say thank you for that. And my wife and I have been with Manna in January. It's actually going to be 23 years. So I was able to actually be, I was the first one that joined Manna after Bruce and Pam O'Neill started this ministry. And so it's been, it, it, it just seems like yesterday that this ministry has started. And so just to look back and see how God has put his hand on this ministry and blessed this ministry. But the thing is, we could not do what we do without the local church 
and, and people like you here at Pecan Baptist Church. And we're going to share with you a little bit, of maybe a new project that maybe you'd like to have a part in it. But let's go to the next slide. I, I just got back from um, a recent trip to Guatemala last week, and I actually leave Friday to go back to Guatemala. And I just wanted to share with you a little bit about what we do on trips. And I know back there there's a sign-up sheet. We're, we're looking to take your church on a trip uh, in, in March or April of next year. And so if you're interested in going on a trip with us and with me, um, we'd love for you to sign up and then we'll let you know where we're going to go. Um, but I just want to share some things with you. Uh, first place we want to share with you is in San Lucas, Guatemala. And if you go to that next slide, and we're going to show you a picture of some of the things that we started doing. About eight years ago, I, I really felt like, you know, when I take people on a missions trip, you know, we take them to the feeding centers, let us see what we do. But I want to see people have an opportunity to actually minister and to actually uh, have an opportunity to share the gospel because that's what our ministry is. Our main outreach is to share the love of Jesus Christ. And, 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 if, and now every time I'm preaching in a church, I'm sharing with you that it's only through Jesus Christ that you can come to, to know him and to get to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. And so if you're here this morning, that's the same message that we are sharing here at this church. Just like we were sharing with this, this young lady right here uh, last week with Pastor PJ there in San Lucas. Um, we go in and a couple of things that we've been doing is we've been going and, and actually going to these homes and ministering to them with food baskets. And we share that, you know, here's some food that's going to last you maybe a week or two. Um, but then we go right into the gospel, sharing how they can know Jesus Christ. And at this particular visit, uh, we were able to, PJ was able to lead this, this young lady and her, uh, her husband to the Lord. And it was just an exciting time. Last week, we got to see seven people trust Christ on just a mission trip with the church that I took. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, in El Arado, we're trying to do some new things in El Arado, which is another village there. Let's go to the picture. One of the things that we're doing is, uh, you know, we're going into villages and we're seeing people. Actually, in El Arado, we have a medical center there that we help support. And one of the main things that they do when they're in this medical center, or the people that they see are people that have respiratory diseases. And the reason why they have their respiratory diseases is because they're in closed areas like this and they build an open fire and that's how they cook. And so when they cook, the, all that smoke that's in there is getting into their lungs and they get a respiratory uh, infection. And so we're going right now, we're, we can actually, this is a, a wood burning stove, but it's vented. So it, it, there's, no, there's no smoke in there. And so we're going into this village and, and El Arado, and we, last week we put seven of these stoves in people's homes. This was one of the ladies. And this was, this was kind of a sad story because as we're putting the stove in, this lady was there, and we started sharing the gospel with her. What's the next picture? Yeah. And, and, and you see her there on the right, um, and we're sharing the gospel with her right next to the stove. And one of the saddest experiences that we had that she rejected Christ. And the reason why she rejected Christ is because she said that her family, if she did this, would disown, disown her. And um, the lady on the left with holding the baby is her daughter-in-law, and she was standing at the door. And we were just fixing to leave after she rejected Christ, and we asked her, what about you? Would you like to share, would you like to accept Jesus Christ? And she said, I'll, I would love to share, I would love to accept Jesus Christ, but I, I truly am also afraid of my mother-in-law and what she would think of me. And the mother-in-law said, if you want to accept Christ, you can. And so we led her to Christ right there. The, the group that I went, we left there and we got back to our, our hotel and we were discussing that that night. And they said that was just some of the you know, greatest, yet it was depressing um, trip that they had taken that particular day visiting this home. Because they saw somebody reject Christ, but then they saw somebody accept Christ. And so we had tears of joy, and we had tears of sadness at the exact same time when we were talking. But this is what took place last week. Okay, and then Rama Blanca is one of our centers down right on the coast. And if you want to go and see some hot things, it was hot. Now, this lady, this lady is, she actually started, I don't even remember Steve, 
she actually, we had her, we had the feeding center Rama Blanca in her house when we started there. And now she has a block home. Back then she just had, you know, dirt floors and metal building. But we started the feeding center about 11 years ago in her house. And I visited her about three weeks before this trip that I took last week. And um, come to find out, she hasn't been able to see in three years because of cataracts. She said, everything is just blurry. And so I came back home. I contacted a church. And I said, there's a church. There's, a, there's a, an individual down there that for only $800, we can have her see again. And so they sent it. And I had just gave her, and that's what the water cash she has in her hand. And I can't wait. We're going back next week. And I'm going to see her, and she's already had her cataract surgery, and she, she is hopefully going to be able to see me next week when I go back down there. So, so for th- over three years, she hasn't been able to see, but now she's going to be able to see. And imagine having a service on the beach. We actually had a service. If you see there in the back, that's actually waves coming in from the Pacific Ocean. Unbelievable experience down there, uh, just praising God in 90 degree weather. So it was just wonderful outside. But anyway, it's great. It was nighttime. wasn't that bad. And then I had this lady uh, came over and she wanted me to hold her baby. This is a five day old baby. And so I got to hold a brand new baby. And so um, I want grandkids, but I want son-in-laws first. So if anybody would like to have, if you have, I have a 35 year old and a 29 year old. They're they have great jobs, so you come see me afterwards. <laughs> but anyway, and then La Gomera. We went back to La Gomera after we went to Ram, Rama Blanca. And I want you to see something. They asked me what we wanted to eat. And so they gave me a choice. So I'm holding one, and um, another guy's holding one. And these are live iguanas. Live iguanas. How many of you would eat an iguana? Raise your hand. There are only a few of you. So I picked the green one, okay? So we actually, the next one will show, it's actually being cooked. I had the back leg section of it. Um, A little tough meat. Did you ever, you've had iguana, haven't you, Steve? Um, But they wanted, this was a treat for us. I didn't call it a treat, but that's what they called it. They called it a treat and asked me if I'd wanted to. And then down at our Guatemala orphanage, I just want to share a quick story with you about our, let's go to the next picture. Let me tell you this. The trips that we've taken down in Guatemala, um, we have a guest house, and it sleeps 52 people. God gave us this, 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 this uh, home, and we've added to it. When we take trips down there, um, we actually, a lot of times, we'll stay in this guest house, and right below it, we built an orphanage. Um, and so there's about 24 kids in our orphanage right now, and it's, it's just done great. Um, we're about to celebrate this month, September, 10 years Imagine that, it's the 10 year anniversary this month. We're actually having a celebration next week when we're there um, just to celebrate a little bit about the, the 10 year anniversary. And you know, at our guest house, we bring groups in from the United States and we have very, very nice vans for those, those groups that come in. So if you're on a missions trip down with me to Guatemala, you're able to see some and experience great things across the, the, the country with really, really nice vans. Well, this past year, I was given $37,000 from a church to buy a van. And so I I went and bought this really nice 2022. uh, It's actually a 16-passenger van, and I was just so excited. Not that van. Let's go back to the original one. And anyway, I walked outside, okay? After I bought this van, I walked out. And as soon as I walked out, I saw this van. So I was so excited because we bought a new van for the Americans, and I walked out, and I saw this van, which was a hand-me-down from our guest house, and we gave them this van 10 years ago when we started the orphanage, our old van. The next picture shows what the interior looks like. And so I walked out there, and I'm telling you, I was so excited we got a new van, but then I'm like, this is not fair. It's not fair that Americans... You know, we want to treat them really well, but we treat our kids in our orphanage in these vans and smokes. And, and this is the nicer of the two vans that they have. The other one used to be an ambulance. And um, we actually took the seats out and put old seats in. And those are the two vans that they've had for the last 10 years. 
And so I walked out there and I said, you know what? I'm going to try to do whatever I possibly can to get. I went down there. I said, I'm going to commit for you to get a van, a new van. And so I sent out a newsletter. And, um, and so I had first lady that got my newsletter, 86-year-old lady, 86 years old. She contacted me and she said, I saw your letter. And she said, I have $13,000 I'd like to give for the van. That started the process. Over the next few months, we were able to raise $92,000. So this is one of two brand new vans that the orphanage has down in Guatemala. So the kids are so excited that they have newer vans than we have for the Americans. And so, but we're excited that God blessed that orphanage with two new vans. Here's the thing, they have two new vans and $17,000 sitting in an account in case anything goes wrong with those vans. So God is blessing. Uh, next slide. Uh, some new opportunities in Panama. I want to show you this, this next slide if we could. Um, you know, I, if you've been around, you know that we've had some, we had some um, feeding centers down in Panama, and we had to shut those things down about eight years ago because some misappropriation of funds with our missionary that we had down there. That was eight years ago. I wept um, in the day that all this happened. We had four feeding centers and an orphanage down there. And, um, and so we shut them down, and eight years later, um, the missionary is no longer there. We have a new uh, uh, pastor, national pastor is there. And last year, he came to me, and we met. Um, and so I asked him, I said, I said, would you be willing to um, start some of these feeding centers back? He said, oh, Chuck, he said, that would be just a great thing for us to start them back. And so I committed to him to try to, to raise the funds to start the feeding centers back. We were able to, to get a, little, a lump sum of money. And so I went ahead, by faith, started one of those feeding centers, and this is it. It's in the squatter's village. Um, everybody there doesn't have really any electricity, running water. They have pirated electricity. They don't have any kind of running water there. I mean, it's, it's the nastiest of nastiest place that you can live. And, but we started this feeding center back, and uh, we were able to raise um, um, almost probably about $650 a month coming in. We're, we're sending $1,000. And I was told this morning that I could ask you, I know your church is already sending some money through your, your, your giving designated to manna. We're about three to $400 short for this feeding center. I'm not going to stop it, I'll tell you that. I'll, if, if, if we don't raise that this morning, then I'm going to continue and I'll find somebody else. But I know your church is already committed to whatever's coming in. It's raising from one, maybe $300 a month that's coming in. And we're going to go ahead and start designated. Though. So this feeding center can, t can, t can continue to go. And, you know, I, I've had trouble uh, since I started this feeding center. I was just so depressed because it's been about six, seven, eight months now that this feeding center has been going. Um, and, but there's two other feeding center I'm wanting to start, and I still hadn't been able to get this money. About six weeks ago, I was preaching in a church in McCall, Idaho, sharing this story about how we still need money to support two more feeding centers. I really want to start these other two feeding centers back. And I left there, you know, nobody came up to me at the time, but almost two and a half weeks later, I get a phone call from a man that's in that church. And he told me, he said, would you allow me to cover the expenses for the other two feeding centers? So October 1st, he's given $2,000 a month. October 1st, we are starting those other two feeding centers back. One of them is this one right here. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we'll go back to that picture in just a second. I want to share with you. Go to the next picture, the next one after that. That's the one we're about to start back. He, uh, we were, he, they've been able to go in there, and they fixed it uh, up. They have painted it. And that's one of the two feeding centers that we're going to start back. Let's go back to that little boy. Um, isn't he cute? This little boy is from the squatter's village, the one we just started back just a few months ago. This little boy started coming to the church from the squatter's village after we started him back. And Rafael Rodriguez, the missionary that's kind of overseeing this project down there, um, contacted me last week. And he sent me this picture. And he said, this boy came to know Jesus Christ through the feeding center that we were able to start back. He said last week he got real sick. We had to put him in the hospital. At the end of last week, 
he passed away. And there's the next picture, it, it shows him, he's the one on the right, he got involved in the church there. Um, but let me tell you something, because of the feeding center starting back, this little boy's in heaven today. And um, so he asked us to, if we could, to pray for this family. Um, he just, they, their family came, a whole family came, trusted Christ, but this little boy passed away. Let's go to the next picture. Um, and then we have children, the, the children's village in Guatemala. Show this picture. I'm going to just real quickly, I, I promise you we're about to get into a message. <laughs> but it's a quick message. Um, but I want you to look at this, this young couple right here. This, this young couple took a trip with me 18 years ago. We went to Romania 18 years ago on a missions trip, and they were two teenagers. They weren't together. They just took this picture, and I had this picture. This is Bradley and Stephanie Roberts. They're out of Oak Hill Baptist Church in Somerset, Kentucky, and they went on a missions trip with me in Romania back 18 years ago. And it was a wonderful trip. Tell you whole stories. Teenagers on this trip were just unbelievable. Because of this trip, there is a feeding center and a church established in Rogova, Romania because of the 14 teenagers. That's a whole different story. About seven and a half years ago, I get a phone call from Bruce O'Neill, the president of MANA at that time. And he said, Chuck, we've got a couple that wants to join MANA. And they are going to, um, they're going to call you and we've got to interview them. And he said they speak fluent Spanish. They, they have a, a, a two-year-old boy. And, um, and so when I picked up the phone and called them, I asked him, I said, tell me, uh, how did you get to the point where you feel like God's leading you to be a missionary? And they said this, we took a trip with you several years ago, about 11 years ago, we took a trip with you. And this next picture shows them today, okay? And, um, and they're, they were married. They were married, had kids, had one child at the time. And so you can tell they've kind of grown up a little bit. Um, and so they moved to Guatemala uh, about six years ago and started the process. But her, her, mo her mom and dad paid for the property that we have a children's village, which is an orphanage there right outside of Antigua, Guatemala. And they started the process of opening up this this, this home for teenage boys, and she got pregnant again, went back to the States, had the baby, flew back down, and within 24 hours, that baby almost died because it cannot live in high altitude because its lungs were not fully developed. So they had to leave the field. And, um, but today, because of them, um, they're now youth pastors in Kentucky at a church in Kentucky, and um, they're over a foster ministry through their church. But because of them, we have a children's village today that opened up four years ago. And these are some of the boys. Last week, um, our, the group that I had actually went out and bought uh, some furniture for them. And so they were all excited about this new furniture they have. And so because of that couple, we have this project there in, in Guatemala. And I think let's go to the next slide. And, you know, as I said a few minutes ago, manna does not work without missionaries on the foreign field. And so we, we depend on uh, pastors and churches to support missionaries. You know, like you, you support Stan and the Sherwoods uh, down in, 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 in Panama and Boquete. And they, they're missionaries that you support, but you also support their feeding centers that are down there. So as you can see, we partner with churches, but we, de we de depend on the missionaries and the national pastors on the foreign field to do it. We all come together partnering together to, to start these feeding centers, start these churches, uh, reaching these people with the gospel of Christ. And so let's go to the next picture, slide there. You know, and this morning we're going to talk about, you know, manna worldwide giving. So, you know, it doesn't work without your missions given. It doesn't work without your tithe. I share this everywhere I go. First and foremost, first and foremost, the Bible says that your tithe, a tenth of what you have, you need to give first and foremost to the church. So if you tithe, I, you know, that's what God tells us to do. Then on top of that, many of you give to missions. You support missions, and which has enabled you to support missionaries uh, around the world, to continue the gospel. You know, we're told, uh, Matthew 28, 19, 20, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Ghost and the Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And here's a part. And he says this, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world, which is so cool because I can't do it without supporting churches like you. God commands you to take the gospel around the world. You can't go, but you can give so people like me can go. Your missionaries can go. Your missionaries around the world that are today sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is in their church around the world, sharing the true love of Jesus Christ. And you're having a part in those ministries because you give to missions. And then many of you on top of that give to manna. And we appreciate that. So uh, giving, I want you to look at the next one. Go to first number, number one. Number one, giving to missions is part of our worship. Look with me in Psalm chapter uh, 96. You know, it's part of our worship. Now we we actually, uh, this morning, we worshiped Christ. We worshiped, worshiped him through, through music. Uh, Steve, Betty, and the other ones that were up here did a wonderful job. And as I was sitting on the front row and watching the words and listening to the, the music and the words, we were worshiping Christ. But also giving is also a worship. Look in Psalm 96, and it, verses 8 and 9. It says, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. And then it says this, bring an offering, bring an offering and come into his courts. Um, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, fear before him, all the earth. So when we give to God, when we're given our tithe, when we're given to missions, when we're given to manna, we're actually worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. It's our way of telling him that we love him. When we give these offerings uh, to, the, to the Lord, when you give it to the church, when you support missions, when, sh- when you support manna, it's an act of worship. And that's some of the things that we need to realize that, you know, it's not just somebody just putting something in there and an offering plate and not thinking about it. You're actually worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. And number two, uh, giving to missions is an expression of our love. Let me ask you, how many of you love the Lord this morning? Raise your hand. Ah, good, everybody. We all love the Lord. And it's when we give, it's an expression of the love. To think about what Jesus Christ did for us. You know, to think about the pain, the suffering that he did for us. And to think about, you know, when I travel to foreign countries. Now, I just, I got off of the main highway, whatever that highway is over here into Granbury. And I started, I turned, the, I turned the corner and I went down to your church. I passed a lot of churches to get here, okay? There's a lot of churches in this area. And I'm going to tell you, we live, we don't think we do, but we live in the greatest nation in the world, okay? We are blessed to have churches that we can freely worship in. I go, when I go to Guatemala next week, just getting to some of our feeding centers and, and some of our churches, I'll cross through villages after villages after villages. When I go to the coast, I go through city after city after city. And, you know, I very seldom will cross a church. And if I do cross a church, it's usually just a Catholic church. And so I see opportunities after opportunities to express our love. And sometimes as Americans, we take for granted the blessings that God has given to us to be able to worship freely here in our nation, to think, We could have been born in Guatemala. We could have been born in Panama. We could have been born in Cuba, where we have many centers there now. We could have been born in some communist nation where there's no no churches at all. And so we should be blessed. And giving is an expression. It's an expression of our love that we should have for Jesus Christ, for what he did. And and, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, it says this, For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge, that is, one died for all, then we're all dead. And then the next verse is, is chapter, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 8. And in the writer here, uh, Paul, if you think about what Paul did, Paul, Paul went on many, he went on three missionary journeys, okay? He, he, he got to start churches. He was the first missionary who got to start churches all over uh, in that area. And then he comes back and he writes these, this, these, these letters to the church at Corinth. And in, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8, it says this, I speak not by, by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others. And look at this. And to prove the sincerity of your love. Paul was talking to the church there, and he said, 
Church, I want you to prove your sincerity. How do we prove our sincerity that we love Christ? Well, we share the gospel. Well, how do we share the gospel? Through our mouth and through our giving. That's how we share. When we give, it enables opportunity for people around the world to have the same opportunities that we have here in the United States. And then in 2 Corinthians 8.24, it says this. Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love. The proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. You know what? I can walk in here. I can talk to the pastor. I can talk to Steve. I can talk to many of you. Your church has proof that you love souls around the world. Did you know that? You have proof. I walked back here. I saw missionaries. I walked in the back. I had a, you have a book there that has all the missionaries that your church supports, some 90 some odd through E3, 90 some odd missionaries that today, because of your giving, that's a proof that these missionaries and your church are doing what they're supposed to be doing. You're taking the gospel around the world. There's proof. And then finally, giving, to, giving is to missions is an act of personal surrender. We need to personally surrender. You know, it's, not, it's, it's much more than just uh, giving every single week, you know, putting it into a, a box and, and to giving. It's, it's, it's a personal surrender. And maybe some of you this morning have never really personally surrendered to the Lord. You may be writing your check and not even thinking about it when you write the check. It's almost become a habit, you know, a habit. But to think about when you're giving, you're giving so people can have an opportunity to hear the gospel. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 8, verse 5, it says this, And this they did, not as we hoped, but listen to this, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. When we give and we have a personal surrender, it means we're giving of ourselves. We're giving of ourselves. You know, 20, almost 24 years ago, um, I went on a mission trip. I went on the very first trip that manna ever took. And I remember on that trip, I saw an opportunity for manna worldwide. I saw the very first feeding center established in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, 20, almost 24 years ago, the, the, week, of, the, day after, the week of Christmas. And I saw that feeding center, and I thought at that time that there's is an opportunity that I may have a part in starting uh, centers and churches around the world. And on that trip, I told God, God, I surrender to you. I surrender to do whatever you want me to do. And I remember it was, it was scary. It was scary because I had a great job. I, had a, I was an executive pastor of a church making very good salaries. And, and I totally surrendered to God to do whatever he wanted me to do. And at that time, starting off with Manna Worldwide, I didn't get a salary. I had to go raise my support. But God took that, that surrender, blessed me. And today I look back at 24 years and had an opportunity of, I probably have started about 80 to 100 of those feeding centers around the world and those projects, been able to start many, many churches, not to be boastful at all, but God enabled me after I surrendered to him. And I realized, you know what, I can't do that part where it says, um, go take the gospel in Matthew 28, 19 to all nations, unless at the very end he says, and lo, I am with you always. I realized that I could not do what I do without the Holy Spirit working through my life. I sat down. Every time I stand up before uh, a, a, a congregation, I always say, God, let me, let me be gone and you speak through me. Let my words that come out of my mouth are your words. You know what that is? That's a total to surrender to what God wants for me. God wants you and wants every one of us to surrender to whatever kind of need that people have. There's opportunities all around here um, that God has given to us. And uh, there's, an, there's a couple of verses. There's a few more verses there in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I put it up there if you want to look at it. It says this, but this I say. He which soweth sparingly shall reap also what, church? Sparingly. So it's like, ah, I'm just going to throw God a couple dollars. If you expect him to rejoice in that and, and because of our attitude that we're doing something, then God's not going to bless us. But he says, and he which soweth bountifully shall also re reap bountifully. And then I love this part. Every man according as he purposed in his heart. See where it starts? It starts in the heart. 
Doesn't start in our mind. Doesn't start in a pocketbook. It starts in our heart. And he says, every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. And I love this part. Not grudgingly or necessity, for God loveth what? A cheerful giver. He wants to, now, have you ever just laughed when you gave your offering? <laughs> That's what he's saying, basically. He's saying, man, just enjoy. Enjoy giving. Enjoy giving to, to, to a ministry. Enjoy giving to your church. He's saying, enjoy what you're doing, cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound in every good work. I look in my life, how my wife and I, we, we, give, we give our tithe to our local church. We give to missions. I was taught as an eight-year-old boy that uh, you need to give to missions. And so we, we give to missions. And then every month we get to manna so kids can have an opportunity to hear the gospel. And God has blessed our life. And, uh, uh, amazingly how God has blessed our life. And then the last thing here. The more we give, the more souls are saved. And then I just put in here, let's all do our part in reaching the world for Christ. Do we really want to reach people for Christ around the world? Do, we, do you really want to reach people for Christ? Would you like to help us with this new feeding center? Now, I will tell you this. If Pecan doesn't do it, I'm gonna, I'll find somebody that does. But there's kids in a squatter's village in, um, in Panama, in the city of David, that are, are going to be fed in the morning. There's close to 100 kids in that village right now I mean, that come to our, 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 our feeding center there. Can you put that picture up on that with the one that when they're all the kids – um, in the, there's just a carport right there, and I want you to see them. Yeah, no, nope, no, nope, one little bit before that. There they are. That's the feeding center that um, whatever is coming in for manna, we're going to start putting towards this feeding center. And you know, they're limited. What do you mean they're limited? Well, they can only feed so much. We send $1,000 down there. They have more kids, they say, that need to be fed. And so what happens if we get more than three or $400? then I can call the missionary down there and say, you can increase the giving and you can increase the people uh, that you're reaching and you can start taking on more kids. Wouldn't that be great for me to be able to do that? And so God will take that opportunity. And what's so cool about manna, when you meet a physical need with somebody, not just the kids, but then you go knocking on their doors of this village, they know that, they know that church is meeting those kids' needs physically. And you know what happens when you meet a need, when you have a need, it opens up their heart that shows you care for them. And then we're able to get into those homes, share the love of Jesus Christ, and we're seeing not only these kids trust Christ, but we're seeing their parents trust Christ as well. Then they send a bus down there. They're sending a bus this morning. There's a bus that's heading down there. Um, they're already at church right now, but there's a bus down there that are picking these kids and their families up and taking them to church. These other two feeding centers were starting October 1st. They're going to send buses out in those areas, and they're going to bring those children and their parents into church so they can hear the love of Jesus Christ. I want you to bow your heads this morning. I don't know where you stand spiritually this morning, but maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You know, we've been talking about what Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus Christ came to this earth and died and paid the penalty for the sins of the world. And he loved you so much that he was, it was, he was worthy and worth dying on the cross for the sins of the world, this world. And not only did he die, but he rose again and he's alive today. And he gives the opportunity for every single person when they hear about the love of Christ, the opportunity to receive a free gift of everlasting life. And he offers it to us today. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what? I've never one time trusted Jesus Christ as my personal savior. But this morning, I'd like to do that. We're going to have an invitation here in just a minute. There'll be people down here that can show you 